I always find if I'm going through something, be like, God, if, why didn't you just work on this timeline? I wouldn't have had to go through this. I could plan this so much better. So often when it comes to pain and issues of our heart, we think God's timing is so incomprehensible. We don't get it. Because when we judge God's timing, we are judging it off our perception of our current circumstance, where God's in the habit of judging His timing off the truth of His Word. Well, it's my privilege to come around the Word of God today in this season of faith, love, hope. It's all uh, everywhere on, on the uh, stage behind me and the slides, faith, love, hope. It's a, it's a great season. It's about believing for more. And um, I've always found that it's easy to have faith, love and hope when things are going well. You can believe, have faith in God. You can feel loved from others. You can have hope for the future when things look great. But the benefits of Christianity and the promise of the Christian faith is that faith, love and hope remain that you have them in the good times and you have them in the bad times. And so today I'm really gonna focus on this one right here, hope, this hope. Now they're all interrelated, but I really wanna look at hope when it hurts. How do you have hope when you go through things of hurt? And wherever you're watching from today, maybe it's uh, Australia, maybe it's abroad, there's this cultural commentator that said, and he said this around, this was nationally, he said, At any time, a nation is usually undergoing one or two upheavals of hurt, whether it be things like a natural disaster or an economic recession, whatever it may be. Usually a nation is going going under two upheavals of hurt that really cause some masses of people to feel the pain from it. What 2020 and 2021 has done has really caused, in Australia I know, at least five upheavals of hurt. There's natural disasters. We barely remember it, but last year there was floods, there was bushfires. There's the natural health crisis through COVID. There's relational and family shakeups. Some families have broken up because they haven't been able to see each other in so long because of the distance. Some some families have broken up because they saw too much of each other where their work relations had to come together and they didn't know how to deal with that dynamic, which is a very real thing. There was financial instability, which caused a lot of pain. There was political wariness, which again caused divisions in people as well. There was these upheavals of hurt, which in our society has caused people to feel a lot of pain. Now, we aren't foreign to pain. In fact, in the Christian faith, if you are a Christian, you believe in God, pain's kind of promised. In fact, when Jesus took ground and He got baptised, the very next thing was temptation in the desert. It's kind of like this effect. So if you are a Christian expecting great happy times because you believe in Jesus, they're there, but they're also saddled along some times of pain, which is okay because without, without growth, there is no success, but to have growth, there needs to be change. To have change, there needs to be loss and to have loss, there needs to be pain. So in order for you to grow or move forward in any kind of way, you as a person are going to experience some pain, whether that's now. And and I've journeyed with people in this church in this last season. Many of you have gone through, and some of you have gone through some really serious pain. Some of you have lost loved ones and you've mourned and you've grieved. And there is always a time for mourning and grieving that is biblical to do. And some of you have lost jobs and Some of you have been betrayed by different things and different stories and journeys that I've walked through. Hurt's fine, but unhealthy hurt is not fine. Hurt has this way of coiling itself around your life and keeping you still, like grave clothes and the story of Lazarus, which I'm gonna show soon, that hurt is fine if you deal with it, but unhealthy hurt keeps you still, it keeps you stale, it stops you from reaching your potential with God. So mourning and grieving is great, but I wanna show you why we as Christians have hope in the hurt. The best verse I've found that shows this, and, and I've titled my message, Where's God When I'm Hurting? I've always found that when I'm hurting the most, sometimes I feel God's the most absent. And I heard this all the time, if God was here, this wouldn't have happened to me. We hear that a lot, right? If God was here, I wouldn't be going through this. Where's God when you're hurting? This this scripture, John 11, 17 to 39, it's about 20 verses long and it's the story of Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus and resurrecting him. And in this, there are some incredible keys as to where God is when we're hurting, how we are to process pain and how we can help 
other people go through it as well. Because as Christians, we are called to be agents of healing to the society and the world that we live in. Let me read this scripture. I'm reading from the CSB version. If you have your own Bibles, please turn to John 11, verse 17. When Jesus arrived, He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. So Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God's gonna give to you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus said. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were in the house consoling her saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Notice that both sisters say the exact same sentence, right? Right? Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb. I want you to remember that statement, deeply moved. It was a cave and the stone was lying against it. Remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench there because he's been been buried four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you'd see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd, I said this so they may know that they may believe you sent me. After he said and shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. An amazing story. Amazing story. Jesus resurrects Lazarus. And I don't think there's a better scripture that depicts where Jesus is in our pain. I wanna explain this because it really shows something about the identity of who Jesus was and how we are to process pain. See, first things first, that Lazarus, Martha and Mary, three siblings, them and Jesus were tight, right? He says Jesus loved them. The Bible doesn't use that language anywhere else apart from Peter, James and John. So these guys are are his fan, they're his tight crew. Lazarus is like a brother to him. And yet Jesus still comes after Lazarus has died. He tells his disciples, hey, Lazarus is just sleeping. He's gonna rise again. And he turns up late. Lazarus is already dead. He turns up late and the sisters come out. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. So often, I find when it comes to our pain, God's timing is always wrong in our eyes. I always find if I'm going through something, be like, God, if, why didn't you just work on this timeline? I wouldn't have had to go through this. I could plan this so much better. So often when it comes to pain and issues of our heart, we think God's timing is so incomprehensible. We don't get it. Because when we judge God's timing, we are judging off our perception of our current circumstance, where God's in the habit of judging His timing off the truth of His Word. See, God had already said, Jesus already said, Lazarus is gonna rise again. So the timing wasn't an issue to Him. He'd already said it, the Word of God had said it, and so He wasn't dictated by the circumstances in front of Him, yet we often judge God's timing based off what we see. God does not have a time management issue. God does not... Uh, need to download Google Calendar and be like, oh, scheduling issue, I can do one or the other, I can't do both. God, God's, term, God's timing is perfect. And when we doubt God's timing, often we say, we could have done it better. What are we saying? God, I could have done it better. I'm, I'm more capable than you, God, which is in itself a kind of stupid statement. Yet so often we come out like Martha and Mary, God, if you had been here, I wouldn't have had to go through this. So often we do that. But 
Martha comes out first. Martha is one of the sisters of Lazarus, comes out to Jesus and said, Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I know he's gonna be resurrected in the last day, but he's dead now and I'm grieving. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes across, confronts her heart with this big, bold, authoritative truth. He comes in and says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Though if anyone believes in me, though they die, they will rise again. Or if anyone believes in me and doesn't and dies, he will live. And so Jesus comes across saying like, I am God. Like I'm confronting the flow of your heart right now. You say it's not possible. I am God. I've seen the future. It's gonna be okay. And so he confronts Martha in this way, this big, bold truth. And then Martha goes away and Mary comes. Now Mary comes and what statement does she say? Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Right, two sisters, exact same. They come out and they say the exact same statement to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so here you are reading the story. I'm expecting that Jesus is gonna go tell him, I am the resurrection, Mary. It's gonna be okay. But Jesus doesn't do that. With Martha, he speaks, but with Mary, he's speechless. With Martha, he is this big, powerful, God-like Jesus, but with Mary, he's this fragile human. With Martha, he confronts the flow of her heart and says, no, this, but with Mary, he enters into her heart space, enters into her emotion, and he starts to grieve with her. Do you see the difference? It, it depicts this incredible dichotomy of who Jesus is, that He is fully God and that He is fully man. Because if He was just God and just the ultimate truth, then He'd never be able to relate to humanity through tears. But if He was just human and just shed tears with Mary, then He would never be able to be the ultimate truth as He can with God, I am the resurrection. So Jesus shows with these two sisters holding these two different questions that he is God and He is fully man and that He ministers to people in pain through truth and tears. Truth without tears doesn't work. Tears without truth doesn't work, but we have a God who ministers with truth. And, and this is super important because if you are gonna journey through hurt that you're experiencing or you're gonna help someone else journey through hurt that they're experiencing, you need to see this about Jesus. This is the hope in the hurt. In times of pain, in times of hurt, you always depend on something to get you through. Every human does. Every human will depend on something to get them through the pain or the hurt they're feeling. It can be different things. It can be relationships and money and respect and, and different people, whatever it may be, but those both things have to be present if you wanna deal with hurt. Does, can, can money help you grieve? Can money enter into your heart space and understand what you're going through? Can that relationship with that person give you eternal life and say, I am the resurrection, I am the truth? Because my God does that. Jesus can do that. Whatever you believe in for your trouble and your hurt, can it do both? Can it minister to you in truth? And can it minister to you in tears? Because if it can't, it's doing one or the other. And I'll show why you can't do truth and tears, or truth or tears in just a moment. He loves Martha with this big, bold truth. And he loves Mary with compassionate tears. And you need both in your greatest moments of trouble. Because if you just loved in truth or just loved in tears, it doesn't help you. Some situations require God ministering to us in truth. Hey, I've seen the future. I know it's gonna be okay. Get out of that flow of your heart. Get out of where your heart's currently going on that trajectory. It's gonna be okay, come with me. Sometimes we need ministry like Martha, but sometimes... We need a God that ministers to us like Mary that enters into our heart space, full knowing that He's about to turn a funeral into a feast. He's about to perform this resurrection that's gonna to make, let everyone rejoice and celebrate. Yet still in that moment, He partners with Mary's grief. He partners with what she's going through and understands, enters into her heart space. That's the God that we have. Not one that just stands apart and be like, it's gonna be okay, believe in eternity, it's gonna be right. But he enters in and feels and understands the pain that we go through. We'll never be healed of hurt unless we have someone that comes to us to bring an ultimate truth, but ultimately partakes and understands in what we're going through. That can only be Jesus. There's no one else on planet earth or beyond that can do that for you. Jesus loved in truth and tears. And I see this dichotomy of Jesus' identity almost laid out on a societal level sometimes. 
Even sometimes we do it on a political level that the way we approach life and as different types of people, you kind of fit into this big scale. On one end of the scale, you've got the truth end. Because like traditional conservatives, there is a God, there is a truth. I don't want that in my schools. I don't care how it makes you feel. This is right. That's, that's this end. I'm not saying any of these is right or wrong. On the other end is like your tears. So that's the truth end. This is your tears end. So, well, we can't really know there's a God. How do you know what's right and wrong? But there are some grand injustices in the world and I will be angry about them and I will weep with you, with you about them. Both these ends of our society, we see people all amongst this, but truth without tears doesn't change anything. It just makes people hardened. But, but also tears without truth is a house of cards as well because these guys are saying, well, we don't know that there's a God or there's any absolute truth, but there's definitely absolute evil because we're fighting against it. You can't have an absolute truth without an absolute evil. But what this shows me is that right now, where we are in our society, as the church, we have this unprecedented opportunity to reach the world with the gospel like we have never seen before. Because these guys want the truth. They want a truth so they can meet the truth. And these guys down here are starting to wake up to the fact that they've got this cavity in their heart. Why am I built with this hole in my heart to fight for these injustices? And they're starting to realise, where does that come from? And so right now, in the, in the parable of the sower, there's this good soil and hard ground and the path. And right now, what we're seeing, these upher- upheavals of hurt are beating the soil of people's hearts and turning hard soil into good soil. And right now, we have the greatest opportunity to take Jesus as the answer, as someone who ministers in truth and tears to a broken generation. We as the church have never seen a harvest this, re- this ready and this white and this ripe before. We can sow seeds and people, I, I, I fully believe that we're gonna see people not who believe in a truth or conservative or maybe how we've seen it traditionally in Christianity, but people who are first generation Christians realising they have this God-sized hole in their heart for injustice coming into our church. We're gonna see a whole bunch of new people coming in that we've never seen. And so I believe right now we have this unprecedented opportunity, but the seed needs to be sown. <laughs> It means us in our workplaces, in our friendship circles, wherever you are, we need to sow right now. This is the season that we can sow a Jesus who ministers with truth and tears, not truth or tears. That's the Jesus that we have. And so Jesus, identity, you, know, you can apply it on the societal level, but I also like to apply it on a personal level, on, on your life. We all naturally drift towards one of these ways. In, a, in who we are as person, as people, and who we, how we outwork things, I call them fixers and feelers. As in, if you are naturally dispositioned towards outworking the truth, you're a fixer. If you're naturally dispositioned to to tears, you're a feeler. So I don't know if you've ever had someone like this, Josh. You might have had someone like this. You're going through some pain. You're going through. You've you've lost someone, or you've you've lost your job, or whatever. And someone comes up and goes. Great, all right, I see what you're going through. Here's your answer. These are the three things you're doing wrong and here's the 12 things you need to do to fix it. Have a great time. That's, that's, that's not gonna help Josh in that moment. That's a fixer, okay? And my natural disposition is a fixer. <laughs> Me and my, my, my wife, Ruth, her natural disposition is a feeler. And so many times in our relationship, and, and some more recent than I'd like to admit, Ruth would come up to me and she will say, I have had a rough day. I'm, I'm very frustrated. I'm angry. I've been at work. Uh, and I've got to take care of the kid. I don't feel like we have any time anymore. Our schedules are too busy and I am frustrated. And so naturally being the fixer, I'll come in and be like, no worries, let me take Bub tomorrow morning. That'll give you some time to relax. Let's make a list of all the things we have off and we'll cull, them. We'll cull some of them. Let's make some time. But babe, sometimes if God's called us to it, we just got to get through it. <laughs> and then all the fixers are like, what a generous man and what a great solution. <laughs> and then Ruth looks at me with daggers because I haven't addressed the fact or even entered in face that she was frustrated and angry. I didn't even acknowledge that. But I'm like, I can fix that if I just do this. <laughs> and, and fixing is my natural disposition, but fixers are not like Jesus. But at the other end of the scale, sometimes you can have the feelers. And like my wife Ruth and the feelers, they naturally enter into people's heart spaces with them. They naturally enter into people's problems. They understand and they feel what they're going through. 
But just being a feeler isn't like Jesus either because so often they can sit there and be like, it's okay, I understand, I feel what you're going through. Six months later, I still feel what you're going through. (laughs) And they don't move out. Sometimes they can get stuck in this mud pit of people's hurt. See, it's truth and tears. A feeler isn't exactly like Jesus and a fixer isn't like Jesus, but sometimes you need to identify that you are these things. If, you, if you're a, a fixer like me and someone comes with a problem, I've had to learn this in my pastoral journey. Someone comes in and I send them away, here's what you do, bang, bang, bang. And that person will go out, but they, they're probably leaving worse off than when they came because no one has entered into that pain with them. No one's journeying with them. And so we have to adapt the way we do things. And the way you know that you are growing in your faith, the way you know that the Holy Spirit is regenerating you from the inside out is that what you once did naturally, you start to do both. That if you're naturally a fixer, you're also able to be a feeler. And more than that, you start to have the ability to discern between your Marthas and your Marys. You start to have the ability to discern who needs truth now and tears later and who needs tears now and truth later. This is how the Holy Spirit wants the church to be agents of healing in the planet. That we can work with people, that we can journey alongside them, not just leaving them in the mud pits of hurt, but helping them walk through. Some people need your tears now and truth later. Some people need you to confront the flow of their heart like Jesus did to Martha and give them tears later. And that's how we grow and that's how we um, apply this, how Jesus manifests Himself in us because He is both. God and man, when, he, when we are conformed to His image and not the ways of the world, we start to be people who can heal the world by bringing both truth and tears. Don't let it pigeonhole you. So often we put titles on these things. Oh, I'm just a fixer, classic me. Like, of course I'm not gonna you know, associate with that. I could, and that, that would end up in a really bad marriage between me and my wife if I was like, I'm the fixer, she's the feeler. I don't you know, enter her heart space of her feelings and she doesn't put anything practical in place. That would end in a really bad marriage. But if Jesus is working in us and the Holy Spirit regenerates us, we both become both. We still have your natural disposition towards each one. But this is how we start to be agents of healing in the world around us. And, and if you are going through pain, this is some great insight, but it's not the most powerful part of this scripture. The most powerful part of this scripture comes from verse 33 and 38. Remember I said, remember that statement, Jesus was deeply moved? I love this statement. The CSB says deeply moved. When I think deeply moved, I think like almost saddened and a bit passionate about it. But this word is only used twice in the New Testament. It's this word, I'm not gonna pronounce it because I got it terribly wrong in the service just before. So then Jesus deeply moved again and came to the tomb. It's this move, deeply moved, grown, deeply troubled, And we would think that Jesus coming to it like almost saddened coming to the tomb, but that's not what this word means. This word means is like a primordial rage. It's like you have a lion and a hunter comes and takes its cub. What that lion is feeling right now, that's how Jesus is approaching the tomb. He is angry. He is quaking with anger and rage. That's the Jesus that's approaching the tomb. It's not the time for weeping anymore. This is rage. Jesus is angry. Super, super angry. In fact, this is only used one other time in the New Testament when the woman comes and brings her perfume before Jesus and breaks it open and wipes her feet. Judas, how angry he is that she wasted it instead of giving the money because he loved money. That's the anger he felt towards her. That's the anger Jesus is feeling right now towards as he approaches this tomb. He's approaching the tomb like a gladiator approaches another gladiator for battle. I'll tell, show you where the battle is, but... I always wonder why was Jesus weeping? So it got, it's rage there, but it's, it's weeping back here. Why was Jesus weeping in that moment? Yes, he loved Mary and yes, he loved Martha and yes, he loved Lazarus, but he knows he's about to turn that funeral into a feast. He knows he's about to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. So why is, why is he crying in that moment? And I love Tim Keller's analysis of this. He says he's at this funeral and he looks at this funeral and he looks at the grief and he looks at the mourning and he looks at the sadness as a human. But remember the dichotomy of Jesus that he's fully human, yet he's fully God. So as a, as a man, he's looking at the grief around him. That's not enough to cause him to weep because he knows he's about to alleviate all of that. But as God, he's also looking through the past, 
the present and the future, knowing that yes, he's interrupting these funerals, but look at all the funerals that he can't interrupt. He sees you and he sees me and he sees the sadness that we deal with and the tears you shed over that child and the time you had to bury that loved one. He sees you in all your grief and he sees me in all my grief and he enters into our heart space with us and he's weeping in that moment. He's, He's devastated that the humanity that He loves so much would have to go through this. In your pain, in your suffering, when you go through these things, where's God? He's right there. He's felt it, He's been there, He's, he's seen it. And He knows He's gonna alleviate the pain of the Lazarus funeral, but He knows how many funerals and how many sufferings He's not gonna be there for as He looks through us and He sees you and He sees me. And he's like, there's no hope for that hurt. And so he decides to make a way for us to have hope during our hurt. And this is when he approaches the tomb and he gets angry. He's dealing with it at its source. The battle is, because in verse 53, we didn't read through it, but it says, as from this moment, the Pharisees plotted to kill him. As in, once he did this miracle on Lazarus, the Pharisees were like, this cannot continue, he has to die. But Jesus looking at the tomb says, if I have to open this tomb, I know I'm gonna seal myself in one. That if I interrupt this funeral, I'm starting my own funeral. That if I alleviate pain here, I'm gonna go through all the pain. That right now in this moment, Jesus is enraged. He's about to do battle with death. This is where the battle begins from this point on. And it rages through the Garden of Gethsemane right through to the cross. Jesus is angry at sin. He's angry at death and suffering. And He's like, I'm gonna do something about it so that the people that I love would have a hope in this hurt. The only way to alleviate the pain is to go through it Himself. And He's he's looking at all of us in this moment. He's doing battle on behalf of all of us in this moment. That the only way to interrupt our suffering and the pain that we feel for those that we love and is to cause His own. The greater the anger, the greater the love. If you're a parent in this place and someone tries to do something to your child or tries to lure them off and get them onto drugs or anything, as a parent, you don't sit idly by why that happens. You get angry for your kid. This is the anger that Jesus is feeling right now on behalf of you many. I'm, he's so angry that we have to go through it. It was never His design. The greater the anger, the greater the love. And because of Jesus' furious love, He creates a hope in our hurt. He calls Lazarus forth. He calls Lazarus out of the dark place into the light place, out of the place of death into a place of life, out of a place of hurt into a place of hope. There is biblical seasons for mourning and grieving. I'm not saying you don't mourn and grieve. It is healthy to mourn and grieve and deal with your hurt, but it's unhealthy to stay in that place. Like the grave clothes wrapped around the body of Lazarus hurt can wrap around us and become a part of who we are. And so I love this, that Jesus looks at the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And for some people today, you've been carrying that hurt in your life for too long now. It's, it's, it's become uh, moved on from being the biblical season of, of mourning and grief. And now it's become a part of who you are and it's stopping you encountering the joy of Jesus and the fullness of life. And for some people today, He's gonna say to you what He, he said to Lazarus. He calls him forth and He says, unwrap him and let him go. And the grave clothes were unwrapped from him and Lazarus enjoyed this amazing meal of dining with Jesus. And for some people today, you've hung on to hope or offence or trouble for too long. And in this moment, I'm gonna pray in just a moment and I believe that Jesus is gonna call some people's hearts, come forth, unwrap him and let him go. And the hurt's gonna fall off your life. Just let it fall off your life. Only Jesus can do that. Some of you, it's gonna be a journey. And Jesus, you've only ever known Him as truth and He's gonna minister to you in tears. And some of you have only known Jesus as tears, the comforter. He's gonna minister to you and confront the flow of your heart in truth. But we have a God who doesn't just watch from afar, but enters into our pain with us, with the purpose of taking us from 
pain into purpose, from hurt into hope. Let me pray today. Lord, I pray for everyone in this place that has been going through pain, been going through hurt. And Lord, You have designated seasons for mourning and seasons for grieving. That is healthy, Lord, but if there's been hurt around people's hearts and around people's lives that have gone on too long right now, Holy Spirit, I pray You start to show those people. Right now, I pray You start to reveal and start to talk and start to call people saying, come forth out of your hurt and into hope. Right now, I just sense You saying in people's hearts, unwrap the hurt and let them go. I feel some people breathing freely for the first time in a while. Even if you're at home watching this, if you're partnering with us online right now, there's some people that hurt has been part of your life for too long. That offence has been part of your life for too long. And right now the Holy Spirit is saying, let it go. Unwrap it from your identity and let it go. And as all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you don't know Jesus like that, if you don't know our beautiful God like that, I wanna give you an opportunity to today. If you don't know Him as a God that's personal and tears and powerful and truth, He wants to meet you today. Right now, in this moment, it's not an accident, you're here, you might've been coming here for years, but you don't know Him like that. You don't know Him as your Lord and your Saviour this moment is for you. On the count of three, I would just love you to put up your hand so I know who I'm praying with, that Jesus is gonna come and minister to your heart and take up a residency in your heart. One, He knows what you've been going through. He knows the pain, He knows the journey. Two, He has a purpose and a fullness and a joy for your future. So if that's you today and you need to know Jesus like that, three, I would love for you to put up your hand in this place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hands going up all across this place. Thank you, Lord. Let me pray for every hand that went up today. Lord, you are ultimately powerful and ultimately personal. You can do everything, yet you care about everything that's dear to us in our hearts. Right now, these people going through pain, will you minister to them? For the ones that made decisions to have you as the Lord and Saviour of their life, you don't just bring a correction around them, Lord, you, you walk with them. You enter into their heart space where they're at right now and you weep and you cry and you laugh with them as you take up residency in their heart for the people that made decisions in this room or the people that made decisions online and where they're watching at home right now, Holy Spirit, will you start to bring a joy around their life? Will you start to bring refreshment around their life? Comfort around their life. And Lord, we know that all of heaven celebrates. And right now we do too in Jesus' Name. Can we put our hands together for all those decisions that were made this morning?